So today's talk is going to be about scaling laws or power laws in deep neural networks. Actually, this is a retread or a revisiting of ground that I covered in the very first MetaUni event back in January 2021. So the very first talk that was ever given at MetaUni was on this subject, on the subject of power laws in deep learning and what deep learning theory might be for. And it feels like about 100 years ago, <laughs> I have to say, uh, in terms of the progress that's been made. So I'll be going over some of that more or less in the same way I did uh, two years ago. Uh, but there's been a lot of progress since, and that's some of what I'll cover today. So you'll see around the world there are various boards with um, some papers on them, and I'll say a little bit about each of the papers. Uh, given the time constraint, I won't be able to go very deeply into any of them, so this is more meant to be a kind of entree into a important and fast-evolving area of science than a kind of detailed look at any one part of it. Okay, um, so let me give a brief overview. So I'll start by saying something about what a scaling law is. And then I'll give a quick history of scaling laws uh, in deep learning, which really starts in 2017. And then I'm going to uh, say something about the uh, implications for model selection as a principal mode of doing statistics. Uh, and that'll come down to a comparison between the RLCT or Lambda and the power law exponent, which uh, I've been writing as gamma following Watanabe. And uh, I'll end with some speculative remarks that I made actually in that talk two years ago, and I would argue have now been borne out uh, and uh, which seemed to me to characterize what the next era of deep learning progress probably looks like. So let me start with what is a scaling law? You should ask questions at any point, obviously. Well, that I can answer in on this just this slide. So a scaling law is just a relationship between two quantities that looks like the following. Right, that's a scaling law or power law. Uh, maybe typically B is zero. Uh, so then we get something like this, of course. So a function that looks like this is called a power law. Power laws are very common in many areas of science from modeling, uh, from models in biology. Physics is probably the first place that power laws were noticed uh, pervasively. There's a whole theory in thermodynamics about why power laws arise from critical phenomena. Uh, I'm not going to really touch on any of that. Uh, so a power law is just a function that looks like this and um, power law scaling is uh, is when such a power law appears in your system and they've uh, people often refer to these power laws in deep learning as scaling laws or neural scaling laws uh, but it's a little different to the way that you would talk about them in physics but I'll follow the deep learning literature terminology and just refer to these things as scaling laws going forward Okay, so where were these first noticed in uh, deep learning systems? So this is a, a graph from a paper. Uh, I have the title here somewhere, just a moment. This is often not cited, but this is the first place that people, as far as I know, 
noticed uh, power laws in, in deep learning. Yeah, so it's uh, deep learning. Scaling is predictable. Empirically. So this is uh, Hessness et al. in 2017. So what they did was they trained some transformer models, also LSTMs, on various tasks, uh, mostly natural language, if I recall correctly. And they observed uh, power law scaling. or test loss as a function of data set size. Okay, so that's what you see here and here. By generalization error, uh, what they mean is test loss. So cross entropy on a test set. So the task generally for these language examples, which is most of what I'll talk about today, is to predict the next token given some sequence of previous tokens and the tokens are taken from some dictionary. Um, for GPT-3, there's 50,000 possible tokens. So imagine a distribution over these 50,000 tokens. The model outputs some distribution. You take the cross entropy between that distribution and the truth and that's your loss. And you, the model is optimizing that loss to zero. And that's what's being graphed here, although it's the logarithm of the loss. So if we go back to this, this first page here, so if I take this formula and I take the logarithm of both sides, I get this. So. This is what you'll see in the y-axis in these plots, and this is what you'll see on the x-axis. Right, so in the case we just looked at, x is the data set size, and uh, y minus b is the test error. So a few remarks following what Hessness and all uh, observed. Uh, they observed that for at small scale, say small data set size, there is now power law behavior. Uh, that's what you can see in this graph here. All right, so you sort of don't get on the power law train until sufficient scale, and then you start to see power law scaling. And uh, in the examples we'll be interested in, gamma is negative, so let me just fix this power law back on the first board and change it to a minus gamma. And that means that this is a slope with negative gradient. And that's what you see in this power law region, right? The slope here is the gamma. Or minus gamma. Now the test loss never goes to zero. Uh, there's some irreducible error, as they call it. Uh, so you eventually converge to that, and that's this B that I've got on the first board, right? So that's this B here is, is to do with the what's denoted by irreducible error in that plot. So if you subtract this lower bound on the error from your test loss and take the logarithm, then for some range of scales, you get power law behavior. That was what was observed. Well, they call it power law. Of course, you could argue that maybe they didn't do enough to try and fit other kinds of functions to this graph, uh, and that would be an accurate assessment. But uh, their reporting is that they observe a power law behavior uh, as described. Now, this paper was, uh, not a lot of attention was paid to this, so this is the first that I know of that discussed power law behavior in uh, large-scale neural networks. There may have been 
papers looking at power law behavior in, say, one layer networks earlier than that. I'm actually not clear on the chronology, uh, but this was, I believe, the first paper to do this at large scale using transformers and so on. So let me see if I want to say any more about that. Yeah, I think it's worth um, observing that we can roughly kind of think of this as a graph also of um, the history of deep learning. So why didn't we see power law be behavior earlier? Right? Deep learning, the modern incarnation has been going since 2012. So why is it 2017? Uh, that's only five years. It may seem like a strange question to a mathematician, but uh, five years is a long time in, uh, in the deep learning universe. So why did it take so long to observe uh, these power laws, well, it's just a matter of scale, right? So, uh, up until uh, up until 2017, uh, we were sort of arguably in this era here, where our models were too small and our data sets were too small, so that we didn't notice power laws. And it was inevitable that as we scaled things up, we would see power laws. That leaves out the role of transformers as a particular architecture. Uh, it's unclear which architectures have power law scaling and which don't. LSTMs in this paper do have also power law scaling behavior, so it isn't restricted to transformers. But you can find more recent literature which shows that uh, many other models, including LSTMs, may have power law scaling for some region, but it's much smaller than transformers. And even variants on transformers yeah, it's very strange. The transformer model that's being used in cutting edge papers is essentially the original one. There have been probably at least a thousand papers on variants of the transformer, but it's like some kind of bitter lesson uh, gladiator battle where all the contestants trying to improve transformers just fall off the scaling law cliff and can't compete with the original exponent. It's kind of funny. Uh, so. To this day, transformers are the still the main thing people are using to take advantage of the scaling laws, uh, and we haven't found better models with better scaling laws, uh, but more on that in a moment. Are there any questions about this, um, this first slide? Could you guys say a little bit about what the transformers are, or what makes it? special. Is that yeah, I can say a bit about what makes them special. I won't go into the details of the architecture today. Or maybe I'll do that next week or some other time. Uh, so mm -hmm. transformers as compared to say a, a simple dense feed forward network uh, involve, you could say message passing or an attention mechanism, uh, which is okay, uh, you know about the icing model. So think about an icing model and uh, how neighboring spins influence a given spin. There's a kind of dot product involved, right? And that's, that's kind of the one way of thinking about the basic idea in a transformer. But the reason why you might think that, okay, you might ask, is it the attention mechanism or some other detail of transformers that really makes them uh, work with the scaling laws? I, I don't know the answer to that. Nobody does as far as I know. Uh, one of the reasons they're important is that they scale very well with compute. So they're very parallelizable. And that's one of the crucial uh, things about a transformer. Apart from that, yeah, I think the, the relevant thing to know is that transformers are kind of an inductive bias that says you should model your data as being made up of entities that interact. So it's a kind of relational model of data based on entities and their relations. And that is the key inductive bias in the transformer. And to the extent that, you know, you can, uh, whether or not that is actually a good description of how transformers are modeling the data is, is a question for interpretability. Uh, so I don't, don't recommend you buy too heavily into that idea that it's really about entities and relations. That's Maybe not the case, but that's uh, how people usually understand it. And I think there's some truth to that. Yeah. Okay. So the 
Next paper I'm going to highlight is the GPT-3 paper. From OpenAI, this came in 2020. Uh, of course, GPT-2 was before this and then GPT before that. Uh, but GPT-3 was the first time you really see an emphasis on this relationship between scaling, uh, compute, data set size, and model size with performance. And this relationship wasn't really characterized in detail until a, a follow-up paper, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, yeah, maybe I won't say too much about in-context learning just yet. I'll come back to that. But this is really the highlight of the paper and, and what they chose to use as the title. It's the idea that, so this is... Uh, So what made GPT-3 special was it's a transformer. In some sense, it's the same model that existed back in uh, 2017, I think was when transformers were introduced. Uh, it's the same model, just scaled up and trained on a large data set. So at that time in 2020, 175 billion was uh, a big number. And it's not considered to be a big model anymore. But this, um, well, Okay, that's a bit of a complicated story, I guess, but uh, things have progressed a lot since 2020. What was really new about GPT-3 was this emergent capability, which was uh, in-context learning. Yeah, maybe I will say a few words about that. It informs the rest of the context. Um, I think the second slide is a bit hard to read, so let me just write something here. So how does a transformer work? Well, it takes in some number of tokens. So Tokens come from some set T of tokens. T is about 50,000. So think of these as words, for example, or parts of words. So a token is roughly speaking about four characters. So including spaces and punctuation and things like that. So you take a token, maybe Mary had blah, 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 um, evil. You, there's a learned embedding of those tokens, that discrete set, into some vector space. And there's a, an inner product on that vector space. And every entity, or you sort of think about the individual words as entities, each entity receives signals from every other entity, depending on, so let's, let's say this is entity E2. Uh, let me take that back. So once you've embedded, you've got a sequence of words, you transform them by some learned embedding into some vector space, you call the images of those tokens under that mapping entities. And then each entity is updated by paying attention to other entities. So E2 prime is some function of E1 through EN via something like the dot products. It's a bit more complicated than that. Uh, really, from each entity, you extract by learned transformations a query, a key, and a value. And what updates each entity are values that are propagated with weights. <laughs> 
Let me make this entity EI. Entity EI is updated by receiving signals from all the other entities. The other entities propagate signals to EI based on the dot product of a key vector that's extracted from the jth entity, a query vector for the ith entity, and a value vector for the jth entity. So EI prime is a function of a sum that looks up to normalization like this sum over j, e to the qi dot kj vj. So passing messages between entities, they receive information from all the other entities through multiple rounds. So this passing messages happens uh, for some number of rounds. And then you take the resulting final entities, say e1 final, e2 final. And then you make a prediction for the next token. Okay. Um, these learned transformations that produce the original entity representations from the tokens and that produce queries, keys, and values from entities, those are the weights in the transformer, or at least some of the weights in the transformer. And that's learned by stochastic gradient descent. But in context learning, which is this emergent ability that happens at scale, that happened at the scale of GPT-3, but wasn't present at the scale of GPT-2, uh, is the fact that within this context, providing tokens to the transformer in this context doesn't change its weights. But within this context, you can provide examples of tasks that you want GPT-3 to do. So instead of saying, Mary had a little lamb, you could say, uh, AB becomes BA, ABBA becomes ABBA, ABBB becomes BBBA. And that's a sequence of examples of a reverse string operation. And if those examples occur in this context, and then you provide as the last piece of the context a new string to reverse. Uh, GPT-3, I've done this many times. Uh, you may be unlucky if you try it, but generally speaking, GPT-3 will get it and perform that task. So that's what they mean by in-context learning, and that's one of the key examples of a capability that emerges at scale. Any questions about this last discussion. All right, so we'll move on to the next paper, uh, which is in another place, so follow me, please. So as I said, the, they noticed in the GPT-3 paper, uh, well, obviously they, they knew all of this, these papers are published very close to each other, uh, but it was only published in the GPT-3 paper that they trained many scales of GPT-3, different sizes of model, and then compared them, and you could see a kind of power law behavior, which was described there. Uh, but it was in this follow-up paper that they published much more uh, complete results where they trained the models at many different scales of compute, that is training time, uh, data set size, and model size, and uh, tried to come up with an empirical formula which described the results of doing that. And uh, here you can see, it's a bit hard to read, but this top left graph is uh, Okay, actually, it's the middle one that is similar to the Hessness et al. result. Right? So the middle one is a graph of, it says test loss, but it's really the logarithm of test loss and test loss minus some, uh, some number against the logarithm of the data set size. Uh, that is, these, these axes are logarithmic scale. And you see that there's a straight line, uh, which is 
what we also saw in that earlier plot. Okay, but they also noticed uh, similar power law behavior for uh, graphing um, against compute. This is just the number of cycles that the, if you add up all the cycles executed in all the GPUs that are training the model, uh, there's a power law behavior with respect to that as well, and uh, also with respect to the number of parameters. Now there are details here, so it's uh, when you're scaling up the data set size, you also need to be scaling up compute and parameters appropriately in order to see this power law behavior. I don't want to get too much into the precise details of how they did it in this paper, because unfortunately, this paper is somehow wrong uh, in a subtle way that was later clarified by uh, a paper we'll talk about in a moment out of DeepMind. So this was the first paper to really systematically explore scaling laws, uh, but it's not the definitive um, presentation of the scaling laws for transformers. Uh, unfortunately, it's, you know, it's quite a complicated business and it was a little bit off what they presented here. Okay. Um, let me just think for a moment. So, we observe scaling laws, but for what? Well, for transformers trained on natural language. What do I mean by trained on natural language? And what is the task? Well, I kind of outlined it briefly just a moment ago. So you're given a sequence of tokens, for example, a sequence of parts of words, and your task is to predict the next word. And the relevant loss there is the cross entropy. On what text? Well, you scrape a large amount of natural language in English, perhaps primarily, but, uh, but also many other languages with, with a less, uh, a smaller population from internet sources, from Wikipedia, from a large corpus of books, uh, etc., etc. So you take many, many tokens of text from the internet and you train it on this simple task and you observe these power laws. Now you could say, looking at that, that this is a natural language phenomenon. So the question that remains in 2020 is, what is the proper scope for these scaling laws? And that has been clarified uh, in subsequent years. And this is uh, one of the good examples. Uh, I'll say more about other areas that scaling laws have been uh, detected in a moment. Uh, but you can see later in 2020, they published this paper, which is uh, showing also scaling law behavior for the same kind of models, some small tweaks uh, on images at small scale here, but uh, this has been observed in larger images subsequently uh, on text to image and image to text tasks on video and on mathematics problems. Um, so this uh, starts to look like a kind of universal phenomenon across many distributions of data. And uh, since then people have, so plus, uh, reinforcement learning tasks, uh, protein modeling. So people have turned transformers to large data sets of proteins um, described by um, DNA sequences and the associated data is various biologic information about the proteins, uh, chemistry, uh, what else? We'll talk about some other examples that are along the lines of math problems uh, a bit later, but yeah, this, this is like a, a huge industry now, finding scaling laws in, in many different areas. And at this point, it's more of a surprise if you don't find a scaling law in the sense that you go looking for the things that are wrong with your model or wrong with your data set and you fix them and then you find a scaling law. I know a few papers like that. So at this point, it's expected to be a fairly universal phenomenon with some caveats. 
uh, which I'll, I'll come back to. Any questions about these two papers? Okay. Sorry, what was wrong with the first one? What was wrong with the first one? Uh, yeah, I'll say a bit more about that when I, when I when we come to the paper that fixes it. Yeah, basically they got the exponents wrong uh, because they were not training their models sufficiently. Ah, oh, this is actually that paper. Yeah, let me think if I want to say something about... I'm just going to skip ahead in these slides a little bit. Um, so let's come back to this. Just come over here for a moment, please. Okay, so you could ask the question, okay, well, there's power laws, so what? Right, so what if the test loss behaves as a power law with respect to these various quantities. Um, one thing to note is that uh, power law behavior isn't, this isn't the first time power laws have been observed in, in machine learning, uh, far from it. So uh, power laws have been observed in, in many parts of statistical mechanics and it's closely related to learning theory. So a, a paper I recommend on that topic that we've discussed on the Discord is the, the Shape of Learning Curves, which is a survey from 2021 uh, by Viering and uh, Luc, Luge. So they catalog, maybe it's like 10 or 20 papers that find scaling law behavior, power law behavior in machine learning from random forests to, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a whole slew of different kinds of models. So well, what's the big deal then? Uh, we, we find scaling law behavior in neural networks. It's also in many other kinds of machine learning. Why be so excited about this particular scaling law? Well, I would give two reasons. One is we actually care. <laughs> so, well, there's scaling laws in random forests. Random forests have been around forever. Does the world seem likely to change on the basis of scaling laws in random forests? No. Why then do we see a qualitative difference in the importance of scaling laws for neural networks? Well, it's because as you follow the scaling law, there are emergent capabilities at various scales, which are sort of hidden underneath the smooth progression of the scaling law. So it's the connection between the scaling law behavior, which suggests that, well, the, the scaling law behavior says you can predictably improve the test loss. And empirically, it's observed that as you lower the test loss, qualitatively new and interesting capabilities emerge in these models without being put in by hand. The most important example is the in-context learning that I already described. Uh, this paper here um, details uh, several other examples. For example, um, in the GPT-3 paper, it was documented how addition and other arithmetic capabilities emerge at a particular scale. Uh, and there's other examples along those lines in this paper. So the scaling laws for neural networks are sort of a... Uh, an indicator and uh, related to the emergent of cap emergence of capabilities, which is um, really something new. You don't get emergent capabilities in very large random forests, as far as I know. The second reason that scaling laws are important uh, is that the scaling laws are already the engine of AI progress. So if you think of the, uh, the central 
engine that drives the field forward as being simply collecting more data and more GPUs and feeding it to train bigger models. It's not like the engine by itself is sufficient to make a machine, right? You need to direct that heat, you need to funnel it, you need to control it. There's all sorts of equipment and machinery and piping that's required to feed the raw materials to the engine and to direct the heat usefully after it's generated. And that's happening, and so it's not like scaling by itself is sufficient, just like heat, just like the fire isn't sufficient in an engine to do the work, but it's the, the core tenet on which everything else depends, and the scaling laws are quickly becoming uh, the core of, uh, of much of what's interesting in AI progress. And so for that reason, there um, it's the... It's the emergence of a universal principle that suggests that it's possible to predictably transform energy and chips into intelligence. And that puts us in a position that's really unlike where we were before 2017. Okay, so that's kind of why to care about scaling laws. Let's go back now to the chinchilla paper and I'll... Um, uh, sorry to drag you back to the previous set of boards. Okay, so this is the chinchilla paper. So this is DeepMind redoing the Kaplan et al. paper that we just looked at, which was the first to really systematically study scaling laws for neural networks. Uh, <clears throat> they did it a bit more thoroughly and came up with different conclusions. And their conclusions were that, uh, let me see if I can underline it in the abstract. Yeah, so, what the Kaplan et al. paper said in 2020, in which subsequently directed billions of dollars of investment from large tech companies all over the world, was that you should probably train on about 300 billion tokens and focus on scaling up the size of your models, just the number of parameters. Uh, so people did that, and they went up to half a trillion uh, or even higher. Uh, but the chinchilla scaling laws uh, reevaluate the relationship between given a fixed amount of flops, amount of compute, the optimal way of allocating it between model size and data set size. So uh, that means that it's, it's more optimal to train smaller models, given a fixed amount of compute, it's more optimal to train smaller models on more data, significantly more data. So uh, since this paper was published in 2022, Two, which is still this year it's hard to believe uh, that was in March um, now everybody is rushing to collect more data so this is the kind of new frontier of scaling is getting larger and larger data sets and uh, yeah that's kind of an interesting change of course you maybe you know want to scale both but for the moment we're constrained we can train models uh, at, at you know around a trillion parameters uh, but we don't have the data to train them uh, optimally yet. Okay, let me see. I want to actually write down some formulas. Um, I don't think... Yeah. Okay, let me write down the actual scaling... Oh, no, it's here. It's on the next board. Okay, what's very confusing for us about these papers is that uh, for them, n is the number of parameters, which is our d, and their d, luckily it's capital, is uh, data set size, which is kind of our n, 
All right, so keep that in mind. Uh, yeah, okay. Maybe it's not important to get bogged down in this. Uh, I think I can explain it, but uh, the important thing for us from the perspective of what I was explaining earlier is to just note on this final slide that what they end up finding is that, uh, let's talk about as a function of n. They find that L as a function of n taking the optimal um, uh, data set size uh, looks like a on n to the alpha, where alpha is a half. It's not exactly stated in the paper, but you can just infer it from the way they write other things. So there's a scaling law for the test loss as a function of the number of parameters, uh, which has an exponent of a half. Now, I don't really understand how to compare that to the GPT-3 paper, to be honest. So the scaling laws for the same kind of quantity in Kaplan et al. have exponents that look like 0.0495, so roughly an order of magnitude smaller. I do not understand <laughs> what the uh, how to reconcile that conflict, but this, this one half seems to be uh, very strongly replicated now across not only natural language tasks, but many other data sets. Okay, um, let's continue with um, some of this material over here. Okay, so this is a paper, this is a table from the same paper. Uh, these numbers in the figures aren't uh, exactly the exponent that I was talking about earlier. Uh, they're talking about the optimal number of parameters as a function of compute, which uh, is closely related to that parameter. And so there's, there's an A and B in this table. The first column is A and the second column is B. In their notation, the exponents we were talking about earlier are alpha and beta. But the relationship between them means that if a and b are roughly a half, then alpha and beta are also roughly a half. So uh, hence the statement I made on the uh, previous, previous board. Okay, just to give you an idea of uh, the scaling exponents for different models, and um, this is a, uh, maybe this was published, I didn't follow it up, but... Uh, this was uh, looking at different architectures, both architectures of transformers and also um, different kinds of architectures that aren't transformers, and seeing if they have scaling laws, and if so, what the coefficients are. And um, you can see here they, they also get a similar coefficient, about a half for the original transformer. You should look at the first column. But... Um, the, uh, the performer is one of these more compute efficient transformers that people invented because transformers are sort of quadratic time complexity and the number of entities, uh, which doesn't have a very favorable exponent. Uh, and you can see down the bottom that there's some uh, multi-layer perceptron that only has a scaling exponent of a third. But it's useful to know that these non-transformers also have scaling law behavior, although the story is a bit more complicated than that. The scaling laws maybe don't last as long uh, along the x-axis as they do for transformers. Um, okay, but you don't see numbers much bigger than a half here. So that's the next kind of topic I want to get on to. Uh, one more set of results. So this was yeah, quite recently, so in April, Google published a paper about a class of models they call PALM. Uh, I won't say much about the architecture. It's a transformer, roughly speaking, with some kind of additional features. Uh, the main thing about this is that they, they tested this 
uh, at very large scale, not only in the size of the model, but also the number of tasks. So the largest PAR model was half a trillion parameters, and they trained it on not just natural language, but a, a very wide variety of tasks. Uh, and here you can see some performance figures for um, 150 of the tasks and uh, the uh, scaling law. Well, it's what's presented here is not exactly the it's not the log loss on the y axis. It's um, it's uh, some other metric of performance. Uh, but you can see that on uh, many of the tasks, the the palm model is beating the average human. Maybe one shouldn't read too much into that necessarily, but it's an indication that it's not uh, not pathetic. Um, and some of these tasks really are quite interesting. So some of them are data sets of mathematics problems at high school and um, also undergraduate level. And uh, I'll show you some examples in a moment, hopefully. Okay. Uh, yeah, this way. So now I'm going to talk about, uh, so this paper is from Anthropic. It's a safety, AI safety focused organization, uh, which is talking about this emergent capability business that I mentioned earlier. So at the same time as you have smooth general scaling in the sense that the loss behaves very smoothly as a function of these other quantities, say compute, underneath that individual capabilities often go through phase transitions. Uh, so they maybe the model really doesn't understand how to add or do some other task, and then suddenly it uh, rapidly transitions to, to understanding it. And so the smooth progression of the overall loss is kind of an aggregate of uh, phase transitions on, on many individual subtasks. Uh, although there's some debate about whether they're really sharp transitions or whether you're just measuring them incorrectly, but... For the purposes of today, let's just stick with a simple narrative. And three-digit addition is, is kind of the standard example. So the accuracy of GPT-3 or Gopher or Google, um, I think that's the Palm model perhaps, uh, on three-digit addition is basically zero up until about 10 to the 10 parameters and then rapidly uh, approaches perfect performance as you scale beyond that. Um, program synthesis is another uh, example that's along those lines. Okay, so you could look at these kinds of tasks and say that it's something like reasoning that is being picked up as you scale up models. And at the part, you know, maybe that was a bit speculative at the time of, of these results, uh, but that's becoming clearer and clearer that some kind of reasoning capability is, um, is emerging at sufficient scale. All right, and down here for the last set of boards. So one of the sets of tasks that were that the PAR model was trained on was called Big Bench, and this was meant to be a wide variety of tasks that would be challenging for current large models. Uh, as often happens, these challenges are falling rather rapidly, and the very interesting recent, uh, I don't know when this paper was from, but I think it's within a month. Uh, <laughs> There's a very strange thing that people have noticed, which is a uh, falls under the basket of emergent capabilities, which is what this COT 
<coughs> stands for in this graph, which is chain of thought. So chain of thought is a means of improving the performance of transformer models by adding into their context examples of thinking through a problem step by step and then encouraging them to solve the problem that they're given in a similar fashion. So that's called chain of thought prompting and it improves the performance of models like GPT-3 or Palm uh, significantly on tasks that are heavy on reasoning or mathematics, uh, these kinds of things. So you can see here, for instance, that uh, the, uh, the average score on the big bench hard, BBH, which is a, the subset of tasks in uh, big bench for which Palm, I believe this is correct, for which Palm did not outperform the average human rater. I think there's something like 20 or 23 tasks. Um, Uh, it's still fairly preliminary, but this is a very interesting relationship between, I mean, uh, you see, not only does it improve the performance of Palm, but the larger the model is, the more it improves. All right, which brings me to the final part of the talk. Let me see what's on these other boards. Maybe I'll skip over it. Yeah, I don't need to cover this. Okay, so a little bit of theory to finish off. Now, any questions first about what we've covered so far? So I said I'd say something about uh, okay. There we go. Uh, lambda versus gamma. Okay, so I'm. Uh, I'm using the notation from SLT. The connection between what we're talking about and SLT remains unclear. The test loss uh, is perhaps to be compared to the generalization error, either Gibbs or Bayes, probably Gibbs, uh, but this connection is not uh, established. Uh, similarly, we don't really know how to talk about scaling with respect to anything other than data set size. And even this connection is uh, maybe a little shaky, the number of uh, the, the size of a sample, which is our N in SLT, may be similar to the number of tokens, perhaps seen during training, but perhaps not. So I don't want to overstate how tight this connection is, but I think it's still useful to think through using the tools of SLT, what all this means. And for that purpose, just uh, indulge me in in using these letters and sort of relying on their meaning in the SLT context. So uh, suppose test loss or generalization error looks like um, L minus L zero is lambda on I'll use the n, n to the gamma for some lambda and gamma. So this would be something like the RLCT, and this would be some exponent, which is uh, one in the realizable case, or more generally in the renormalizable case. All right, well, so as I said before, that gives us a relationship that looks like this. That means that if you can affect gamma uh, 
It's more important than Lambda. All other things being equal. Why? Well, because a line which has a steeper slope will eventually beat a line with a smaller slope, even if it starts higher, right? So model selection, as it's currently understood, translates to preferring, assuming that the error is zero, uh, models which are smaller, right? Simpler, lambda, smallest, free energy, lower. Uh, that's model selection. Uh, between competing models, you compare their evidence or free energy, and that prefers models with a smaller RLCT. The RLCT, the log lambda term, kind of looks something like this y-intercept, if you go back far enough. But uh, that's only under the circumstance where gamma is constant. If all your models have gamma equal to 1, then yes, you should prefer a model with a smaller lambda. But if you're in a scaling regime and you can make n large enough to get the lines to cross, and you have the ability to affect gamma, then this is a more important quantity. And you should prefer a class of models that has a, a larger scaling exponent rather than trying to engineer lambda. It's uh, the primary thing. So this is a uh, sort of new era of model selection in some sense, which we're, we're seeing play out around us right now. Yeah. So transformers themselves won, not because there was some uh, comparison really in old school model selection terms, uh, but because they could scale and uh, other models couldn't. And now we're starting to move into an era where maybe it looks like it's actually possible to engineer gamma, which is the, the really radical uh, possibility. So we've seen a scaling exponent of a half for transformer models. And uh, up till now, in terms of typical deep learning practice where you change the architecture, it's not clear how to change the architecture to improve the scaling exponent. But, It seems possible that we're witnessing the beginning of a practice of doing exactly this, not by changing the architecture exactly, although maybe that will happen too, but by changing the data distribution or training process. Uh, for example, this chain of thought prompting. Now, uh, this, this may turn out to not be a systematic way of improving scaling exponents. Uh, and right now it's not something that's kind of baked into the model itself. It's something you do at the end. So you train the model, say GPT-3, and then you somehow encourage it to do more with less uh, by putting in something in its prompt. So some examples that encourage it to, to uh, take things step by step. But you could imagine a future training paradigm where this is built in to the training process. So you uh, are providing training examples during the, uh, not just at the end in the context, but as part of the training procedure. Uh, and if that happens and works, then we may see that there are methods for 
um, increasing the scaling exponent and uh, um, yeah what do I want to say about that Maybe, maybe let's go back to this formula on the previous board. So uh, let me take this and differentiate it with respect to n. So what is, what is the scaling exponent? So the scaling exponent is roughly something like how much you learn from each example. You know, scaled to the number of examples, something like that, uh, which is a pretty good description. I mean, increasing the scaling exponent from this point of view is a pretty good description of what reasoning actually is, right? So, uh, well, let's take a meta step and say, why have deep learning theory? Why have theory at all? Why do you want a theory of thermodynamics? Well, it saves you from doing experiments, right? If you have a theory and you can do a linear regression, you only need to do three experiments and you can infer an infinite number of other experiments from those three by just fitting a straight line to the data, right? So. In some sense, being able to reason is a way of extracting a lot more information from a given set of data points than you would be able to without the reasoning. And uh, it, it seems that we're starting to um, understand how to get deep learning models to do something like that, uh, or at least these connections are quite tantalizing. So this is uh, maybe a prediction for where things are going over the next uh, two years. And I'll stop there. Um, thanks, everyone. Questions? Thanks, Dan. That was really helpful. I a little tour. That's fabulous. Uh, yeah, so the, the notes for the talk that I gave two years ago are on the seminar webpage. That's Deep Learning Theory 1. So, uh, yeah, so I asked a question at the end of that, which was, uh, a plausible definition of reasoning is that the ability to use additional computation to extract more marginal information from each additional training example. Uh, I asked, is there a formal relationship between reasoning, logic, and scaling exponents? And I, uh, I think it's appropriate at this point to double down on this expectation. I do think this is uh, the, the future of uh, what we're going to see out of these models based on particularly the results that have come out over the last few months uh, are very much in line with this idea.